Hey guys, this is Lawrence. So welcome back to the Ketones and Coffee Podcast. And thank you so much for tuning in. I know everyone here that's listening are here because you want to create a sustainable, healthy lifestyle through the ketogenic diet. And every single week, I try to bring in guests that not only has knowledge, but these individuals have also been through the same trials that we all have been through when it comes down to our search for a better health. We get together in hopes to assist you on your own journey. Guys, stick around. We have a special guest today. Our guest today is a certified nutrition specialist, an international speaker, and she also holds a master's in human nutrition. She has a website and blog called To It Nutrition, where she writes about a wide range of health and nutrition-related topics such as insulin, metabolism, weight loss, diabetes, PCOS, thyroid function, Alzheimer's disease, and more. She also wrote a book called The Alzheimer's Antidote, which is about using a low-carb ketogenic diet as a nutritional intervention for Alzheimer's disease. I'm here with Amy Berger. Amy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on here. Love to have you on because there is a lot of confusion with uh, with just starting keto. And you also have a book. Um, and you've been on the keto space. And if you don't know Amy Berger, then what are you doing? <laughs> um, you also served in the U.S. military. And I always wanted to know from someone who actually served, what's military food like? <laughs> I want to start there. <laughs> Oh, um, <laughs> it, it depends. It depends on where you're stationed and what the situation is. But in most, most circumstances, you, you kind of have a choice. It's like a cafeteria. So there's plenty of junk, plenty of carbs, but there's yeah. always some kind of meat or some kind of fish, you know, even if it's just a burger patty, you, yeah. you can eat low carb if you try. It's not easy, but you can mm. do it. Yeah. Oh, that's now, good if, to you're, know. if you're deployed in a forward location yeah. in a combat theater, might be very different. But when you're kind of just at your regular job and you have yeah. a, a normal place to eat, you, you can do it. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know for people, right? Um, I invited uh, Amy here today, guys, to learn more about her story with you know low carb to understand how a low carb, uh, high fat diet or ketogenic therapies can improve you know brain health, where she specializes in. When, when I came across keto about two years ago, two to three years ago, Amy, your book is one of the books that came on my radar with, along with Jason Fong and many others. Um, that will be a focus of the discussion here today, guys. And just giving you know a lot of hope for people, especially in neurological and, and neurodegenerative disorders. Um, you know, using a ketogenic uh, th therapeutic approach in, in treating those diseases, um, just, you know, um, especially Alzheimer's there. And you, you also talk about how keto can be used to help with a wide range of uh, disorders in, involving the brain. Um, I want to start here, Amy, though. Um, I understand that you had discovered low carb for yourself uh, about 18 years ago. Is that right? It's probably about that long mm. ago. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> Yeah, and and, mo and most of us, uh, I started keto to lose weight as well initially. And my story goes, uh, I told my story numerous times on, you know, about how my anxiety and depression dissipated after a couple months on keto. And I had so much energy that that I needed to do some something with it. And, to, and it fueled this journey for me. And I understand that you found it almost accidentally as well because nothing else was working like many of us um, tell us a little bit about what you got you in involved in the low carb space yeah I um I was a chubby child I was I was overweight as a kid and uh, my <laughs> my parents literally owned an ice cream store so I <laughs> I ate my share of junk I mean I know why I was a chubby kid but as I got older I started exercising and I started eating what I thought was a healthier diet and I could not lose weight no matter what I did, no matter how I tried. And I think I was healthy and I was fit. I was strong. I was, you know, physically fit, but I was heavy. And uh, just, I spent so long blaming myself and beating myself up. And um, long, long time ago before, you know, all these internet listings, my mother got a copy of the Atkins book at a yard sale. 
back when they still had yard sales. Yeah. And she, she actually never ended up reading it, but I did. And it made sense to me. Just the way that Dr. Atkins explained things, it made sense. And even though it was so different from anything I had ever tried, I figured I've already tried all of the right things and all of the things that are supposed to work and they're not working. Like what, I've got nothing to lose by trying this other thing. And um, it worked, it worked. But if anyone out there has tried low carb and stopped and tried it and stopped and tried it and stopped, you are not the only one. I didn't stick with it the very first time I tried it. It took me a few times before this became the thing that I do. And mm. what I loved about it was I can, you know, lose weight and maintain that, keep, keep the weight off all these yeah. years without starving myself, without having to count and track everything I eat mm. and do. Um, I get to eat delicious food. And pr probably like you, I, I tell people all the time that over the years that I've been learning about this, even though I personally got into it to lose weight, what I know about the biochemistry of lower carb and how this all works, mm. weight loss is, is one of the least impressive things that this can do, right? You can literally reverse type two diabetes. You can reverse PCOS. Mm. You can support brain function, get rid of hypoglycemia. All of these amazing things happen and you can also lose weight if you want to, yeah. but it's, it's just such yeah. a powerful, mm. um, powerful way to eat. Yeah. yeah. How do we shut up about it, right? Because, you know, we I talk about this all the time and with everything that everyone's been going through because with, with my parents, they are getting up there in age and most of these, most of what they have are these mo modern diseases, right? And it's actually them, you know, hearing me about keto, keto, keto and how it, you know, helps everything. <laughs> Uh, which you also talked about this in your talk back in 2019 about Parkinson's and MS. Um, you quoted uh, Dr. Jeff Volick there. Um, keto is a really big hammer and there's a lot of little nails out there. And um, I love the way you talked about this because it's becoming so hard to talk to people about keto, right? Uh, because again, uh, I experienced this firsthand and I, I, got, I got my parents, my friends, you know, they got, I got a friend that... Um, turned 31 years old and diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and that's really sad to hear for me and you, you you don't hear that often but it this is what this is what we're this is where we're going i believe and if we don't stop it i, I love that's why i love your your work i love your writing and your ri writing style and how you're breaking this down because it really caters to people outside of the low carb you know world people who are just starting off their journey for me because for me keto is confusing uh, in the beginning enough in nature because of its you know going against the standard american diet standard advice etc when you first come across keto if you're paying attention enough you you got a lot of questions but you made it your mission to not overcomplicate it why do you think it's so important to remind people how simple this is yeah i think I think because if, de depending on who you find out there and what, mm -hmm. you know, the first exposure people have to this, it, you know, it could be somebody on YouTube or somebody on Twitter or Reddit or something. Right. And some people make this way of eating sound really, really complicated. They make it sound like you have to weigh and measure your food and track it in an app. You have to measure your ketones and all this. and. For people that want to do that, that's fine. You, you can do that, but you do not have to. You do, none of that is required to be successful with this. And I just wish if, if more people knew how simple and straightforward it really was, mm -hmm. they might be more willing to give it a try. Now, I, not everybody needs keto, right? As, as much as mm -hmm. we know how powerful it is and how amazing it is, there's plenty of people that are healthy eating higher carb diets and that's fine. But for all of the people out there living with all of these, you know, mm -hmm. medical problems or just not feeling their best, yeah. they might feel like a completely different person if they would try this, but they, they might not 
be wanting to try it because they think it's expensive and it's yeah. complicated and like your whole it's like a full-time job just to follow a keto diet when it's mm. it's really not it now yeah. there's depending on the situation you might have to be a little more careful about certain things but just to really get started it's all you really have to do is keep your carbs really really low that's the main thing that's going to get people really far all by itself mm. Mm. and the question that always comes up too with people who are brand new to keto is the safety of it before they start they always ask for safety is it safe to be on keto for two months why do you think why do you think they ask that why do you, why do they why do you think that it comes to their mind about safety yeah i'm i'm kind of smiling because isn't it funny that nobody asks if it's safe to, to eat the way they're eating now? Is it safe to keep eating the way that got me morbidly obese and, and brought me type 2 diabetes and brought me PCOS and insulin resistance and hypertension and migraines and gout? Is it safe to eat that? Nobody asks that, but I think that, but I, I'm not making fun of people. It's just interesting that that's how our minds work. I think people are worried about the safety of keto because they again they think they have an idea of what keto is when, when a real true healthy ketogenic diet or what what doctors uh, Stephen Finney and Jeff Volokh would call a well formulated ketogenic diet is really just good quality protein foods healthy fats and non starchy vegetables so when you ask it that way is it safe for me to eat good quality proteins vegetables and healthy fats the question almost becomes ridiculous. It's like, why would you even ask that? Is it is it healthy for me to eat real good, wholesome, nutritious foods? But the, the thing is that people don't realize that that's what keto yeah. is. They think it's some, I don't know what, but if, yeah. if they knew Lots what it version. really was, they wouldn't even ask. Yeah, they, they probably see those, you know, I always say not all low carb diets are ketogenic anyway. So when people ask me that, I, I always tell them about you have to really look into how keto works and what keto is and how you feel you're in your body. Because yeah. if you're just assuming that this is unsafe because it induces like maybe you've seen somebody lose 200 pounds on keto, then your mind, I, I, I wouldn't blame you if you're not looking into it. I wouldn't blame you to because that's my first question too. Okay, I saw one of my family members lose about 200 pounds on keto my mind goes to that can't be safe right and what i say to people you have to look into how the body works how keto how ketosis works and how you're fueling your body and start there and you'll understand how it's working and like yeah. you said a well formulated keto diet is is how it's actually being been done right cuz there's so many yeah. There's so many uh, versions out there that right, they're labeling think, everything keto. Yeah, Go I ahead. think one, one of the other issues, though, is that, you know, all keto requires is a low carbohydrate intake. So you could you could do it as a vegetarian. I don't think it's easy, but you mm. could do it. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. But I think people have to get past the old mm. thinking that, you know, red meat is bad for you somehow or saturated fat is bad mm. for you. And it's not that you have to eat a lot of red meat. You don't. You could do a keto diet as a pescatarian or, a, you know, if you just want to eat eggs and fish yeah. or something, that's fine. But um, most of us eat a fair bit of animal protein and, you know, butter and cheese mm. and saturated fats. And, and so people kind of have to get out of that old thinking. So mm. it does... It does take some mindset shift, but I, I always just remind people, if the way that you were eating before was working, you wouldn't even be looking for mm -hmm. something else. So how, yeah. whatever you're doing now isn't going so well. So how bad could trying yeah. something else be? <laughs> yeah, if you're already looking for something else, then your lifestyle is probably not working, uh, which is probably the what triggered most of us in the keto space and low carb space to find something else, find the alternative. Um, I want, I want to go back to your point though, of, about how to explain this to people about low carb and just how simple it is. I want our listeners to learn how to explain keto to their families. Right. And that's, you know, everyone's dilemma in the keto world. I know we can't control anyone to really dig in about learn about keto, 
but we are on this journey because we want to tell people about this the right way. Can you give us an example how you should describe keto to uh, to a brand new person that's somebody that's coming up on keto? Yeah, I think um, you you brought up a great point. We we can never convince anyone to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, even if my, my mother is deceased, she had very poorly managed type 2 diabetes. Her actual cause of death was cancer. I couldn't get, you know, I can't, we can't change anybody else. So, but if somebody's concerned for our safety, if they have questions about what we're doing, um, I think the way to explain it is partially what we said before. I'm, all I'm doing is not eating sugar and starch. Mm -hmm. This is not really a problem. I'm not, I'm certainly not starving myself. I'm not at risk for any deficiencies. I'm eating plenty of good protein, healthy fat, good vegetables. Uh, but, but the main explanation really is that most of the chronic health issues that so many of us face come from chronically high blood sugar or chronically high insulin. Mm. And when you take a lot of the carbohydrate out of your diet and you eat a very, very low carb diet, you correct that by keeping your blood sugar and insulin like at a healthy lower level. Mm. And by doing that, all of these sort of metabolic and hormonal changes happen for the better your blood sugar comes down the blood pressure comes down all, all even mood swings i think a lot of um panic attacks and road rage come from hypoglycemia mm. so to the extent that we can correct those wild swings in blood sugar and insulin a lot of these health problems go away health problems that people don't even know are related to insulin or blood sugar, like people that have multiple skin tags, or like I said earlier, gout, migraines, um, certain people with you know various mood issues, uh, other adult acne, eczema, um, joint pain, heartburn, so many things that we have no idea are tied mm -hmm. to excessive carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah. So I just. That's, that's maybe a little too detailed, but, but the, the main way to explain it to people is that when you cut the carbs, your blood sugar and insulin come down and they stay within a healthy range. And that corrects mm. a lot of this stuff that people are living with now. Mm. And you talk about how keto can really, is, I, I think it's not really about keto. It's about just reducing your carb intake, your processed food, sugar. It's more about that than keto and just getting rid of the junk. I think you, if you just get rid of sugar, you'll feel so much better. Um, and you talk about, you've talked about ketogenic therapies that has, you've observed to help neurological and neurodegenerative disorders. And um, I'd like to shift to that uh, topic there. And you had a whole talk about the commonalities between these issues. What do we understand about how keto works in, in those cases for brain health? Yeah, this, um, in my opinion, is some of the most promising, exciting research being done with this right now. Um, I, like you said earlier, I wrote a book about Alzheimer's disease, but as I started looking into other neurodegenerative issues like Parkinson's disease, multiple mm -hmm. sclerosis, ALS, all of them, Every single one of them, they have a lot in common at the cellular level. And one of the things that we see is that for whatever reason, we, we don't know the cause, but these neurons are no longer metabolizing glucose properly. So they're not getting energy. They're not getting enough energy from glucose. So they're starting to atrophy and wither and die. So of course we have neurological dysfunction from that when these cells are not working properly. And ketones can serve as an alternative fuel when the cells are not using glucose properly, they still take up and use ketones. And that, at least in Alzheimer's so far, it can't correct that fuel shortage 100%, but it can correct it a little bit. And that can improve cognitive function a little bit in some people. Um, in Parkinson's, again, a little bit of improvement in the symptoms and, um, a lot more research needs to be done, but that's mm -hmm. something we know that ketogenic diets and, and not just because of the ketones, that's one aspect. There's a, like, because of the, the wholesale sort of metabolic change that happens on a very low carb or keto diet, 
there's numerous other um, reasons why this might be good for those kind of conditions, you know? Mm, so, so to recap, so the neurons in our brain responsible for a different function in the body is basically starving to that. And, and, and since the pathway for keto is in how ketosis works, how that fuel system works is different. We can use this way to basically bring it back, bring, bring those neurons back to life. Is that essentially what's happening? Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's the sort of the simplified explanation, but I think mm -hmm. that's, um, yeah, that's basically mm -hmm. the, the summary. Okay. So for, so Alzheimer's was known to be a chronic disease or is it still now being, cause for families, uh, the, of the sufferers, it, it is known to be, you know, or was uh, a gen genetic problem for people. And but what we, what you guys have observed in the low carb community and keto space, it is now possible to help this condition and recover and even prolong their life. Uh, this is obviously a great news for you know, and maybe not if not groundbreaking for for everybody. I'm sure families are are uh, willing to try any sort of solution there. Um, talk about this in depth, and like you you, you talked about this a little bit uh, earlier about how keto is so effective, specifically to people who have Alzheimer's. What do we need to understand about Alzheimer's? That uh, can can you explain how keto became an alternative solution? Now, how how keto can become an alternative solution for people? Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't, um, I don't want to mislead people. Keto is not a magical cure for any of this by any means. But considering that the, the main problem in Alzheimer's is that neurons in certain regions of the brain are basically starving for fuel, mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense to try to give them some other fuel to bring them back online, so to speak. And I think that that's where this line of research came from is recognizing that the, the main problem is this energy gap. And so we need to give these neurons some energy. And um, I think having type two diabetes or chronically high insulin. So even if your blood sugar is normal, if your A1C is normal, your glucose is normal, if you have chronically high insulin and there's millions of people out there, that's not an exaggeration, millions of people who have totally normal blood glucose because very high insulin is kind of keeping that glucose normal, that high insulin by itself is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And so um, th those, those are major risk factors, but also it's not the only thing, right? Um, a vitamin B12 deficiency, which I think is very under-recognized, especially among older people, that can cause cognitive impairment, it can cause other neurological effects. And um, not to get too controversial, but statin drugs, the ones that are what they call lipophilic, the ones that cross into the blood brain barrier can and do cause confusion, memory loss, cognitive disturbances. And that when I give my talk about Alzheimer's, I have a slide that is taken directly from the US FDA's website. So it's not me making it up that the Food and Drug Administration mm -hmm. absolutely recognizes that certain statin drugs can cause memory problems. Mm -hmm. So um, it just, it makes, yeah. it makes perfect sense to provide the brain with this alternative fuel and to stop interfering with synthesis of cholesterol that is a required part of all the myelin and all of the neurons. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, and Again, I, I don't want to overpromise. Mm -hmm. If if you are in the very very late stages, this is not going to restore mm -hmm. cognitive function to somebody who is a young healthy person. What it can do is maybe improve it a little bit and improve that person's quality of mm -hmm. life and improve their caregivers and loved ones' quality of life because if mom or grandpa or whoever is affected is a little bit more with it, so to speak, everybody feels better in mm -hmm. in the time that person has left mm -hmm. but in younger people you know because this is affecting people ever younger now i do think the earlier you catch it and the more um the more diligent you are about changing your diet and lifestyle the bigger chance mm -hmm. you have of 
stopping this in its tracks and potentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reversing it, you know, re restoring totally healthy cognitive function. I think it's the same way with type 2 diabetes. We didn't see 30 year olds getting diagnosed with type 2 before. And it's only recently that we're seeing younger and younger people that uh, being diagnosed. So you, you said young people are being diagnosed. Are they being diagnosed or are, are they catching this uh, before it started? Because we, when we're diagnosing Alzheimer's, isn't it that it's already uh, in advanced stages or how, how does that work? Uh, good question. I think it's a little bit of both. I think there's probably a lot more screening now, but I think I don't think we can deny that younger people are actually developing it. And I don't mean people in their 20s or 30s. I mean people in their 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. because this used to be a condition exclusive to elderly, 80s and 90s, you know, elderly, yeah. elderly. And now we have people in midlife starting to yeah. be affected. And the thing is, when when we said that the main problem is that neurons in certain parts of the brain are not using glucose properly, mm -hmm. That is actually detectable in people in their 30s and 40s. They can do certain advanced tests that you can see that the brain is already not taking up and using as much glucose mm -hmm. as a totally healthy brain. But people that young don't have any symptoms yet. Their brain is still strong mm -hmm. enough that it can still kind yeah. of compensate for that fuel shortage. It's only as it goes on and on and gets more severe that you start to show the memory impairment, but it starts that young. What do you think of this theory that we are catching younger and younger individuals with type 2 diabetes, um, neurodegenerative diseases? Because, you know, our grandparents didn't grow up with cereals, eating breakfast, eating all this junk. And, you know, just the, our generation now, my, my generation is starting their day with a high sugar, high fructose uh every day and what do you think of that is that somehow that's based that's definitely causing that that the change in 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 how we eat i think that's a big part of it because mm -hmm. you know i was born and raised in new york i ate a bagel the size of my head <laughs> like every day in high school it's a miracle that i even have any pancreatic function left at all but yeah i think it's it's hard to yeah. deny that the diet is playing at least some role, if not the major role, because we know, mm -hmm. we know that again, the chronically high blood sugar or insulin is a major risk factor for all of this stuff. And what what is causing that? Mostly the way we eat. The way we eat. Um, and you know, we have toddlers now with what, like you were saying earlier, it used to be called adult onset diabetes because the only little kids that had diabetes had type one that they used to call juvenile diabetes. Now it's called type one and type two because we have toddlers that get type two diabetes. We have toddlers with fatty liver. Now we have people in their fifties with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's, it is affecting yeah. people ever younger because now even in the womb and from, from childhood, we're exposed to, to yeah. constantly high sugar all over the place yeah and my you know my when my dad was diagnosed uh type 2 diabetes he, they didn't even catch his pre-diabetes so it was just okay you have type 2 um and he doesn't even know the difference between type 1 and type 2 he, they they did not explain it. i don't know how that how that works but he thinks that it's genetic in our it's in our family so there's a major disconnect there with you know their communication um, and I've heard, I've had so many people on the show that had type two diabetes that reversed it, that had the same experience with their diagnosis. There's not really a much information. They tell, they tell you, you can, you can, you can still, uh, you can maybe moderate and, you know, but you, you'll have to be on medication for the rest of your life. Um, so that's just one part of that. And. I, I want to talk to you about this and you said this is a progressive disease and so we know that Alzheimer's is progressive in nature and you talked a little bit about catching this early how how do we actually is there a way to actually catch this early um, is there a way is there a, a test that you can do um, yes yes and no I think to the extent that 
type, you know, diabetes or prediabetes or insulin resistance is massively increasing mm -hmm. risk, then you want to look at all the markers for diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. So you, your triglycerides and HDL, yeah. the waist circumference, blood pressure, uh, fasting glucose, A1C, all that stuff. Um, I also like fasting insulin to be tested, although it's pretty rare to do that. Um, and if you're, if you're headed down that path, you don't, that's not a path you want to go down. You want to get off that path. And um, I think with, with regard to actual cognitive function, it's a little harder because some of this stuff, like we said earlier, is brewing for a long time before you start having symptoms. So I would say if you, anyone that has just a lot of brain fog or feels forgetful, take that seriously. You know, I don't mean to terrify anyone, but take that seriously. Um, don't don't let that develop into something worse later on you know get you there's there's testing that they do there's the the montreal cognitive assessment called the mocha or the mini mates mini state mmsc the mini mental state exam <laughs> so there's there's con there's diagnostic tests but you wouldn't typically do that unless you were kind of already mm -hmm. knowing that there was a problem mm -hmm. um i think it's enough to just look at the the, the total picture of, of blood sugar and insulin regulation. And like I said, if, if you already feel like you have some brain fog and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, let that be your early warning sign. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And also I, I actually, I talked about this, uh, in many occasions on, about my story that I was somebody that was suffering from anxiety and depression. And there are major reports of, I'm not an athlete, but I I used to be on a diet where I restrict carb, but not low enough to to force my body to burning fat, and I also restrict fat, low low fat. So I'm I'm a low carb diet and a low fat diet. Um, but s since we now know that car low carb diets are not all, all ketogenic, um, it means for me that they are restricting fat and carbs, but not low enough to force your body into a fat burning more. Have you got gotten into that um, conversation before? Because I've had a few uh, bodybuilders on the show that reports that when they were on a cut and they're also on a low fat diet, they experienced depression and, and high anxiety. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, not, not everybody needs a keto diet, right? Mm. I think, I think we kind of said that earlier. Some people do well with a, a sort of mixed carbs, fat. If you're active and healthy and some, you can do fine. Mm -hmm. I do think um, everything always depends on somebody's individual situation. And I think, you know, cutting for a fitness competition or a bodybuilding competition is a very specific kind of um, circumstance where you would be cutting carbs and the fat, like you said, that will induce all kinds of problems because you're basically starving. Mm -hmm. You are, you know, you do need some dietary fat for hormones, for keeping you sane. Um, yeah. I do think that, um, I think that's fine to do in the short term, but that, I don't think that's a good way for anyone to go yeah. long term. You, you will. Um, mm -hmm mess yourself up to use the yeah. scientific term like you'll you'll induce some metabolic effects that you don't really mm -hmm. want and i think now but but there is the problem with people overdoing fat too that's mm -hmm. what i see a lot when people come to me for help with keto and they're they're trying to lose weight and they're we're not talking about professional bodybuilders or competitors people that really have a significant amount to lose there's there's a sweet spot between eating a low carb low fat diet mm -hmm. and eating too much fat on keto like you you do need some but if you overdo it your body doesn't really have a need to tap into the stored fat so even even if you're in ketosis you might not lose body fat if you're eating tons and tons of fat from the outside mm, yeah yeah i i believe that i had also a, an energy crisis back then because i was i was on you know making sure that i'm this that was what I thought was healthy is tr chicken breast and broccoli because um, and I, I, my, I can also talk about, you know, when my dad was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, that was the diet that he thought was healthy too because he was on it for a couple of weeks and obviously not sustainable. Um, yeah. And yeah, um, this is 
unfortunately, it's uh, this is a topic that needs to be talked about more. And your book uh, talks about all of that and how we can uh, fix, you know, our brain health using a ketogenic ther- therapy. Uh, if if anyone is is interested in that, uh, the book is called The Alzheimer's Antidote. It will be on. I think it, it, it's on Amazon. I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is there is there anything else that we missed here, uh, Amy? That you need to talk to our listeners about. Um, if if anyone is either new to low carbon keto and you kind of need someone to tell you how simple it really is, or if you're if you're not new, if you've been doing it a while and you feel totally confused and overwhelmed then I recommend um, the most recent book that I wrote with Dr. Eric Westman called End Your Carb Confusion. And you can find that on Amazon too, um, or at your local bookseller, hopefully, you know, but that is really a very uh, easy to read explanation as to how keto works, why you might want to do it, who should do it, and how to do it without making yourself completely crazy. Um, I think Dr. Westman and I both try to help people see how really truly simple this is you know you can make it as complicated as you want like if you want Mm -hmm. to measure and do all that stuff and get all the devices that's fine but you don't have to like this really is just about eating certain foods and not eating other foods awesome and you also have a youtube channel i believe uh they can also check that out it's uh keto without the crazy Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. People can awesome. just look me up on YouTube, Amy, Amy Berger. Awesome. We will link everything down below so you guys can check that out. Get the book. Um, also, toitnutrition.com for uh, Amy's blog and website. Amy, thank you so much again for coming on and sharing your story here with our listeners. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Yep. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Bye. Amy.